<laughs> okay, Women Matters from the end of September 2022, talking about basic trust or about trust all together. So we are only three today, but in all different countries, Austria, Italy, California, USA. So we will have some different perspectives. First, checking in. Christine. Okay. Um, yeah, things are going well. It's summer is over, but I'm uh, kind of doing the last remnants of summer things in the evening, um, going out to concerts and basically acting as if there is no COVID. Don't, don't take a lot of precautions at this point beyond the, you know, very basic things. Um, but I'm out in the world, you know, where people are gathering and that kind of thing. Um, what? We're looking forward to the Sedona Integral Conference. Tom found out he um, was asked by Lynn and Jose, who are leading the conference, he was asked to MC a lot of it. So he's preparing to be involved in that. It's early, the begin, the first week of November in Sedona. What is uh, MC? Everything. What is MC doing MC? Uh, Master of Ceremonies. That's what it stands for, Master of Ceremonies. So he's going to introduce people and he's going to be the guy who gets up in between the presentations and moves things along yeah and what are the presentations about well they <laughs> they titled the conference wtf which in english means what the fuck and everybody oh. knows that acronym acronym is what the fuck you know that it's used pervasively so mm -hmm. i don't know why they uh use those initials but what they meant was uh what's the future so it's about the future of integral and uh wilbur's going to present virtually um nomali uh Pereira is presenting a bunch of people are presenting i don't know know who all is going to be there roger walsh i think i don't know so it's a three-day conference it's pretty long so he's getting ready for that and, uh, you know, still working. So that takes up a lot of my time, a lot of my time and a lot of my mental space. Uh, so I'm, I'm feeling like maybe by this time next year, I hopefully will have made some kind of transition closer to retirement uh, as my office lease expires at the end of 2023. Um, I don't think I'll renew my lease. I'll have to figure out what I'm going to do then. So, um, yeah, kind of sad to see summer end. Uh, I like the long days is what I like about summer. Um, like having a lot of daylight to do things. Uh, but that's about it. Oh, my brother, uh, my brother is waiting for a, uh, opinion from his neurosurgeon. He has an aneurysm in his brain. He had an aneurysm back in the uh, 1994. He had a bleed and he was in his 40s at that time. Um, and he had a bleed and they did surgery and they were able to correct it. And he seemed to do quite well after the surgery. Um, and now he had the same symptoms of headache, dizziness, nausea, you know, kind of like having a migraine. So he did go to the ER and they found the there's a bleed, but it's very uh, small. So he's been waiting for over a week now to be able to get to see the neurosurgeon and find out what they're going to do. So, that, you know, I'm thinking a lot about that. He's going to have to undergo some type of surgery. He's not quite sure what at this point. So he's uh, 70... He's gonna be 75 in a month. So, you know, sur brain surgery at 75 is not uh, a laughing matter, but he's in pretty good health. So hopefully he'll do well. So that's on my mind. Yeah, that's about it. Monia. 
Well, I can feel with you because I had these two aneurysma operations in uh, 2011. When I was, how old was I then? And now I'm 80, 81 almost. So that was yeah, 71. And I have been aware of it ever since because I, I lost my sense of smell and taste mostly, mm -hmm. which I don't mind. Smell isn't that bad. I can, when I concentrate, I can still smell nice smells and the ugly ones I just dismiss, so to say. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm reminded of that operation every day because my skin sort of uh, is less, uh, itches most of the time and uh, on the head. So, and yeah. Did you say you had, you had it twice? Yeah, I had it on one side and it's oh. probably since birth, the doctor said, and it's, uh, it was on a very difficult, it was right in the back of the head. So they had to start out here and go all the way through my brain. So mm -hmm. somebody messed up my brain <laughs> somehow. And it was really afterwards, it was just, I had to put myself together again and to find out what is important and what is no longer important to me. And I've been doing that ever since. And um, now that you mentioned the change of the seasons, I just threw out three pairs of jeans which I'm never going to wear again. And <clears throat> yeah, and I still have plenty of other uh, pants that fit me, luckily. <laughs> um, we don't go out much anymore. And my husband even didn't want to go to the spa, which we usually do around this time of the year. He's very sensitive about Corona and and he's also walking, he's, he's vain. He just, he doesn't want to see people that he's really getting old now or having trouble moving. Yeah. And I'm a little sad about that because I really enjoyed the, the spa and the water and the good food. But on the other hand, it's just, yeah. We have other friends in our age group and it's just devastating about the loss of reality. They still feel they can go and do as they did all their lives and they can't even turn in their beds. And still they hope that somebody puts them in uh, a wheelchair and they will go to the opera by themselves because that's what's important. So we have reduced everything and I don't mind. I have read a lovely book, really lovely uh the last yesterday and yeah two days it's called the house in the cerulean sea cerulean is a, a special kind of blue and it's the first queer novel i've ever read about two men being in love and it's a novel about tolerance and it's in many many aspects and it's sort of really yeah it cheered me up because it's a very warm hearted and it's, it was lovely reading. And so these are still the things that really, I really like. On the other hand, when I get a book like it did about the lady in waiting of Princess Margaret, I really, I read it, but I, it really got me furious because they feel so privileged and so entitled to everything. They don't even ask themselves uh, what misery they bring on themselves and other people and why. So, um, and this was also a, a consequence of the queen's funeral because I'm, I really avoided looking at it, but my husband is a royal watcher and he just likes it. and. And so I, I, I read that book, it's about Bustique, the island they had, Princess Margaret, where she had her younger lovers then. And ah, it's just, it's, it's a book. Uh, when I finish a book like that, I feel 
yeah, I'm, first of all, I'm happy that I don't have their fate in this incarnation because I really would hate to have that. You know, the other hand, when I have find a book like the one is by somebody called Klune, K-L-U-N-E, the house in the Cerulean Sea, and it's about an orphanage of an orphanage for magical children, children who have special qualities, magical qualities. And uh, amazingly enough, one of these, it's, it's a ministry and he has been working for this ministry for 17 years. So he's really, he's really an expert. But this time, one of these children is the Antichrist, the son of the devil. So this makes it a little harder, but still it's just a little child, a six year old child. So it's just, it's fun reading it. So if you really want to get your mind off everything else, I would recommend that book. Yeah. So that's my situation and yeah. Uh, I'm reminded that the body has an expiration date. Almost every day I'm reminded of that. On the other hand, as long as it works, it's okay with me. Are you able to go to the spa by yourself or not? No, I, I wouldn't like to do that. It's, you have to drive there and then you, and I wouldn't like to do that. I would want my husband to be like here and, and, and do his puzzle. <laughs> We finally found a puzzle uh, where you have to guess what changed. So it's not like what you look at because something happens at that very moment and things are different. And this reminds me of how the situation is right now. You really have to work piece by piece to fit your puzzle of your life together. Uh, we had elections and uh, yeah, and in Italy, they had rather amazing elections. And so it's things change all the time. And you just have to fit the puzzle pieces together somehow to make this, because our, our inflation in Austria is amazing. What do you have to pay for food right now and electricity and so on and so on. So it's just very, very, very interesting times as the old Chinese curse is. Heidi, I pass on to you. Yeah, interesting times in many ways. What I heard emerge is also the topic we can do at another time about getting older and how to manage getting older. And, uh, you know, all the little things or bigger things which arrive and how we can we um, keep joy and trust in life despite all these things. Yeah. Uh, talking about me, I have the cat here who's sometimes pushing the computer around or sitting on the keyboard. Yeah, it has become quite cool in Italy. I mean, it's not cold. It's still day, uh, day over the day. It's uh, 23, 24, and at night it's 14 or something. But after summer, when it was so hot, these temperatures feel like cold. I mean, it takes a time. The body needs some time to get used to it. A year ago, it was still warm at this time, even in October. We will see how this time, this winter will come. I don't like winter. I prefer summer in any way. So, yeah, I'm quite fine. It, I have a, a person here now staying for five or six months and maybe another one is coming next month and uh, a couple from Brazil will come in December if everything is working still in December with the airplanes and stuff. So we'll be see how <clears throat> life will go on. Yeah, the, the topic of trust, I, I really think it's an important topic because I feel that I didn't have, as we were talking before about the as attachment styles, I have a uh, anxious attachment style as a not a secure secure attachment from my childhood but uh, I found out by Dan Brown who talked about um, attachment styles that I have this anxious one but because of parents who were not available to to calm 
when there were difficult situations. So I often feel a lack of, of trust in, yeah, I don't want to say in life, but in that it's a strange paradox. In one way, I completely trust life and the goodness of people. And then whenever there came the, come the disappointments, then I turn over into the other pole, into this distrust, mistrust, and and sort of desperation. So uh, I wonder how trust is for you, how this basic trust, how you feel it. I feel in the depth of my heart, somewhere down, down, down there, I have a big trust. But sometimes it's difficult to to find it, you know. So who wants to add something? Um, I think my attachment style is more avoidant. You know, I, I'm more into being independent and self-sufficient and not depending upon other people so much. So it takes a lot for me to trust. Um, but I had, a, I had a pretty secure childhood, pretty dependable parents, um, nothing traumatic. Uh, but I think, you know, my experience was that my parents, if anything, maybe were a little overprotective of me. So I wanted to, you know, avoid, uh, avoid their oversight, uh, avoid a sense of limitation. <laughs> so I became more, uh, avoidant in my style of dealing with people, but, um, yeah, and I think in my relationship, in my marriage, Tom is much more um, wanting more contact and security from me, and I'm the person who tends to step back. Um, so it's an interesting dance uh, that we do. He experiences me as not always being very available, and I experience him as, you know, sometimes intrusive and, and uh, not easily satisfied. So... Yeah, it can, it continues, right? <laughs> it's a dance, especially between two people. In general, I, I pretty much trust the world, although that's getting harder and harder to do these days. It, it used to be easier to trust things, and now the world is so complicated. There's so many facets uh, to it. It's hard to know um, who to trust or how to trust, but trying to maintain that trying to maintain a positive, optimistic outlook, but you know, you get pretty disappointed by current events and what's what's going on in the world. So, um, yeah, do you have anything to add, Sonia? Well, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> we live in complicated times. And usually now we call it resilience. We should build up resilience. Uh, and I have been wondering whether the British stiff upper lip has something to do with resilience, but to me it doesn't. It's uh, the stiff upper lip is sort of negating emotions. And uh, the book I mentioned before brought me on that because uh, brought me to that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we are able to get out of our patterns because I had, as you had, uh, parents who were overprotective and, but in the, during the war, you had to be overprotective to survive. So it's, it's but I, I went from my mother to my husband and he is also very protective. 
but now uh, he sort of found out that and he's a warrior, so he really worries about everything. And I'm not. Why, I don't know, but I sort of felt it's, it doesn't help to worry about anything. It's, uh, you have to act and you have to plan. And if it doesn't work out, you have to have another plan. And if that doesn't work out, well, then you just see how things develop. And this is what, for me, is the basic trap the trust that you feel that the development of a situation uh, is okay. And even if you don't like it, how it develops, it's usually something you can learn something from it. Um, so to me, staying in the flow and being rather alert by staying in the flow is that the way I finally decided is the best way for me to move through life. Um, I had a time when I was rather forgetful. I forgot a lot of things where I put my glasses or where I put my keys and it really upset me at the time. And amazingly enough, now that I get older, maybe because I do less, I, uh, I remember where I put apart from my, my handy. So the handy, I usually look around where I put it. But uh, then my husband calls me and then I find it when I have a ring. Um, yeah. It's, as I said, uh, things develop. I don't know whether you call it fate or karma or uh, just life. But uh, you can't always put your will to what should happen. So being receptive is the way I am now living in my old age. So um, of course I take precautions and uh, whatever I can do. But on the other hand, uh, I'm not that overprotective, and I, I wasn't that overprotective with regard to my two daughters. They uh, had a lot of free, of course, my husband was protective and he was uh, even a couple of years ago, but now he sort of eased up as well. I wonder what it does to you. Uh, that you develop into a certain Enneagram type, the way you grow up as a child. Uh, I don't know if there is, there is, if there is any uh, study on that, what leads to a certain Enneagram type. That would be quite interesting. Maybe Christine King could, has looked in that already, into that already. That would be really interesting. Yeah. When they look, when they look at happiness, mm -hmm. when when they study happiness, they find that about fifty percent of our happiness is determined by temperament. We're born with temperament, and that constitutes roughly fifty percent of how we respond to things. Mm -hmm. And that obviously doesn't change a whole lot. Then I think thirty percent is um, the environment you know, the circumstances that we are faced with that are, you know, beyond our control, the external world. And about 20% is left up to us as free will and attitude and, you know, how we look at things, our perception of things. Um, so happiness, if you want to be happy, uh, part of that's baked in to how you view the world. And I think also maybe some, to some extent, you think of trust as something that only evolves after birth, depending on how you interact with people, but I think there probably is some basis in you know your your general temperament, um, how reactive you are to things, whether you react a lot um, emotionally or whether you're less reactive in, in other aspects of temperament. Now that you mentioned that, I have been wondering, isn't the pursuit of happiness in the American constitution or something? Yeah, yeah. Well, which is amazing. I mean, who has the right to happiness? 
do you have a right to happiness? And to put it into the constitution. That's, that's uh, I guess, an European would never think about that, Heidi. What would you? The opposite. I wanted to say, I think I, in my basic uh, character, I'm quite joyful and uh, and so on, but it was not allowed as children. You know, they they didn't want us to be to be happy. Ah, you are too too. Uh, how do you say that? Um, too nervous, too 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 much. You know, calm down, calm down, and so on. This expression of of spontaneity uh, was always suppressed. For instance, when I sang just for joy, they said, oh, don't sing so loud. Uh, you, you sound like a Blech, Blechbüchse, like a tin and things like that. So all the things which were express, expression of joy, they sort of denigrated it in, in my youth. So this is the one part. And the other part is the example which I had in my mother. And I'm quite sure that she was a four too because uh, now in the looking backward uh, and the very undeveloped for uh, in my opinion and so you i was the first girl in the family and the others were boys so when you see this woman as an example and i didn't have much uh, uh, adult people around, adult women around, others. So you think this is normal and you have to behave like this. And I think, as far as I know, the Enya type is forming in the first four or five years. And I'm quite sure that I have learned that from my mother and dimmed down my energy, my, my, my joyfulness and everything. And now it's sort of, um, it can break through, but it's sort of not so easy. I really need to be inspired and then I can be really, you know, like this. But uh, t uh, decades of habit of trying to suppress. <laughs> uh, I'm just looking around, but I don't see it because when I was exuberant as a child, uh, I was naughty. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, so I have to, had to be, my mother always said, be a bit. Say for nymphic, be rational. That's what I'm yeah, Be rational. Yeah. And yeah. you can see it on the photographs. I sit there grumpy as a cat. <laughs> yeah. And now I laugh at it when I see it. And it, but, uh, it took me a long time to get over that being rational. But I still am very grateful for that. But because being rational helps a lot in many, many situations. And it was good advice, but of course, there is more than just being rational. But I was wondering about uh, whether it's an American trait, this pursuit of happiness, because sometimes you are, you are not definitely not happy. So why couldn't you that be just, uh, it, it has also a, a function of being not happy or being grumpy or being, um, yeah, grumpy. I just think uh, I don't have a sign, but I always uh, I had a time when I just said, well, today is my grumpy day. Don't touch me. <laughs> so, yeah. And then it passes. Well, I, I don't think it means that you're expected or even need to be happy all the time as much as, you know, the, the, um, the phrase in the Declaration of Independence is um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So those three things are guaranteed. And I think it just means, you know, whatever, whatever makes you happy, you have the right to pursue that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can decide for yourself, you know, what it is that is meaningful to you, what brings your life some kind of contentment. Um, they can't imagine that the European Union would have ever put that into, into their constitution. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's so hedonistic, isn't it? <laughs> well, I, and, and at that time, people weren't very hedonistic. They were very much still ruled by Puritans. They were Puritans, Puritans and church and all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe for that as a counter, uh, counter attempt. Yeah, sure get mm -hmm. out of the Puritan mind. But I, I noticed the first time I was in America to see my sister, 
And we went to a, a, a coffee shop or something and the, the waiter came to the table and my sister talked with her and so on. And it seemed to me that they know each other for a long time. And I asked her, how long do you know this? Oh, I don't know her. Do I uh, just met her here. And it was for me so so strange that she was like, ah, da, 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 da. <laughs> so it seems to be a difference in cultural habits, I think. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. Because something you have to get used to when you come as a European to the States, that everybody, yeah, as you said, everybody seems to have known you all their life. And, and but there's sometimes there's nothing following up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course, uh, there are a lot of phrases like have a nice day. Now they do it in Austria as well. Uh, at, the, at the supermarket, they start wishing you a very nice day or when. And uh, the first time I heard it, I looked at it and I said, my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try. <laughs> so, but that's, uh, maybe, it, maybe it improves the sales. Uh, I don't know, but you, you like to go to the supermarket because they wish you a nice weekend. Um, but it, it's very unusual in, 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 in Europe still. Do they do it in Italy? Buon giorno? And... Yeah, they do it. At least, uh, yeah, it comes natural to me to say, uh, have a good Sunday, uh, something when I uh, go away. So maybe it's Americanized. I don't know. I didn't think about it. But um yeah, it makes life nicer when we say nice things to each other, don't isn't it? So, but it, it sometimes if it comes out of a artificial mood, it's not so good. But when I have no problem to to wish really the other person have a nice day, then I say it. And if I don't, then I don't say anything. You know. Yeah, but being wished a nice day. A weekend uh, at the supermarket is strange. I don't know the, the, the girl at the counter. I just don't know her, but I appreciate the way she handles my goods, and, and uh, that's enough. Uh, and I remember to have a nice day. So that was whatever. <laughs> yeah. So we started with trust. Has it to do something with trust? The ways well, I we I wouldn't trust oh, I, I wouldn't trust uh, a wish like that, but I don't have to trust it. I know it's just I put it in a relationship. It's just something we do to improve the sales or to make it easier or the nice. Or I don't know what, but I wouldn't put any trust in in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, are you wishing yourself sometimes a nice day? Myself. <clears throat> Well, my, the other grandmother in my family, every morning, she sends me a, a picture of something very beautiful. Now it's autumn leaves or something, and wishes me a very beautiful or an extremely lovely uh, day. And then she puts on 10 emojis afterwards. I don't know why she does it, but it's uh, maybe something she feels when she wishes everybody well, she feels better herself. Otherwise I couldn't explain it. So I reply to her usually, and I usually send her photographs that I took myself. So that's it, really, it's me and not some kind of calendar or a poster. But, um, and I wonder what Enneagram type she would be because uh, <laughs> Astrology is, of course, a fact, and she has lots of fish in it. So the fishes, they just they tend towards exuberance in this regard. So I don't take it seriously when she sends me this. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think those statements are just meant to be friendly, open, you know, as you said, Ronya, kind of receptive, kind of an openness, maintaining some kind of an openness, yeah. but that she doesn't necessarily expect you to go out and have a nice day just because she said it. 
So, but I just right. sometimes I reply and say today is we have two we have, we have uh, the electrician in the house because we had some problems with the water and this and that and the, everybody's it's drilling and, and so I couldn't really find the day too beautiful but yeah that's the way so people are different and it takes a lot of different people to make a zoo that's, that's but way. you know what you mentioned earlier about um the difference between you and your husband and that he's a bit more of a warrior and and you tend to wait and see what you're dealing with and if it doesn't go well then you go to plan b you know you come up with an alternative that's really kind of the definition of being resilient because mm. resilient doesn't mean that everything goes well it yeah. just means when things don't go as expected or some new circumstance comes up or some problem arises that you have the ability to adapt right, right. You, right. you switch course and you come up with an alternative or you cope with it differently um, and it sounds like that's what you were describing yeah and the other thing i really noticed that for the last couple of days i sort of uh there was a durchbruch uh, so i really trans break through break through Breakthrough. Yeah, that, that sounds so harsh, but I sort of let go of a fixation and that gives so much room all of a sudden when you're no longer fixated on something. And so I wondered why I hadn't done that before. So that's one of the, uh, one of the experiences I really cherish for the last couple of days. Um, what do you mean breakthrough? Well, it's uh, that I no longer am fixated on a certain person or on what he provided me with experiences and also, and also I also left behind most of the Wilbur talk, the uh, abstract Wilbur talk. I'm more, I'm more like experiencing the here and now and this was is different from I was because I enjoyed discussions and uh, just the integral salons. That's why I founded them and in Vienna, and that's why we had them a long time. But now it just doesn't interest me anymore to go into abstract details if except C or G about subtle energies, uh, how it compares to uh, spiritual. Uh, what is the, the last one about spirituality? Uh, integral spirituality, yeah, which he wrote a couple of years later. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter anymore. It's, but there are people who are very fascinated by that still. And so I let them do the talking and I don't have to attend. I was wondering about the uh, term attachment style. Uh, what, what what are the others attachment styles? Do you know? Um, they're secure, insecure, and avoidant. Oh, mm -hmm. and I think there's an, a fourth one that they sometimes refer to as disorganized. <laughs> what is that? The insecure Dan Brown, he's uh, subdividing it, I think, in that one you say, and the anxious one. So two different qualities of the insecure attachment style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anxious. Mm. I have uh, somewhere, I, I don't have it present now. If, if, well, I it, guess uh, I was brought up really in basic because my parents were always rather close. They had, uh, my father was a dentist and the apartment was, it was attached to, the, uh, to our living quarters. So I had had them always around, and at, at four o'clock in the in the afternoon, I prepared some coffee for us, all of us, when I was still uh, uh, going to the university, and uh, we just sat together. So they were always available, and maybe that's what really counts to be close. Yeah, that uh, counts for sure. I remember a uh, part of my anxious style is surely because I was not overprotected. 
my mother was always anxious sitting in the on the open window hoping that we come home but we were quite free in doing and and in the when I was only 10 years or even earlier with eight years I had to take care for my five years younger sister and uh, take them home from some sports events or something and it was dark I remember that and I I was anxious I had I was fearful myself in the darkness and had to take uh, care for the for the younger sister and hardly ever we were accompanied by my uh, parents mm. my father was never there he was in local politics and my mother with five, five children and the big garden she she was not available and then she often was in depression and so on so I had to do this despite of my fear of going into the cellar or into the uh, sofito was it the, the boden dachboden in the attic uh, yeah under the roof you know this uh, yeah attic. And it was always dark and in, in the evening and I always feared that there would be dark forces to to pull me away and so and I I was laughed about it but they didn't nobody ever took it serious they they even mocked me about it you know my older brothers and so I had no obviously now I realize it uh, I had no chance to get out of the fear you know because nobody uh, took it seriously and and calmed me down no and so I developed the style. I'm, I'm quite sure that's for that. Because of actual fearful situation that then um, get uh, generalized to, to the whole life, more or less, you know? Well, your, your brothers or your family were trying to teach you their coping style, which was, you know, to, to minimize it or not take it seriously, you know, not give it uh, weight or not give it importance. And that wasn't, a, that wasn't a way that worked for you. That wasn't, you know, wasn't gonna be something you were gonna be able to use. Yeah, I used it as my style without realizing how detrimental it is at the end when you get older, you know, so. But I'm so glad we have now all these means to, to be aware, to become aware of these things. I think my mother, when she was uh, younger and in, in th these huge difficulties, there was no way to, to, to get help in the situation. I mean, she was depressive, often, often depressed. And I mean, going to a psychologist, it would have meant then that you are mad, you know, you wouldn't have done it, that it was no acceptance of these things. So you, you kept it and without having any friends, you just kept it in herself and transmitted it. And, and I don't think that she wanted to transmit it, but she, she just did, you know, so in, unavoidable. I'm so glad that we have this possibility now to work on all these things and get over them at least a little bit, or at least become aware of it. Mm -hmm. Did you do much reading with on from Dan Brown? And no, actually I had a, a video course, uh, a part of a video course, I got it because I, I heard that it is not available anymore. And so a friend gave me some recordings about uh, the attachment styles and especially of mine and what you can do uh, sort of meditation. But I was about to say um, the, the trust, you can really see it with animals. If you uh, have small animals and you keep them well, now I have this little doggy. They uh, they are so trustful, so trustful these uh, these animals. But when you mistreat them, once they forgive you, maybe twice they for forgive you, and and then it's the trust is gone. Mm -hmm. I had this with a cat. It was my preferred cat, and he was always in the house, and the others were all outside. And when Mark was here, he wanted all the animals inside the house, at least overnight. And so the other animals came in and just already this has pissed him off, this, this cat. He was sort of mm, 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 grumpy. And then once 
he was always also in the bedroom. Once we found this tiny little cat and we kept it under the cover in the bed and this other cat um, discovered it and he was really, really, really angry. And then short time afterwards, we got the dog and that was the end. From then on, he didn't sit on my lap anymore, nearby on the sofa up, up there, but he didn't come to the lap anymore. So I, I destroyed his trust in, in me, you know? So I was very aware of it. I, it I, when the, the last cat was very old, she died with 19. And already two or three years ago, they told me, ah, you should take a new cat and so on. I said, no, before this old cat is not dead, I won't do the same thing again and, and abuse the trust of an animal. And as these things are very dependent of emotions and animals and humans are emotional beings, I think that it's very much the same with, with, with people. When the trust has been disappointed too often then people have no trust anymore or at least big difficulty to restore it what do you think about your uh, you you have it as a profession what do you observe what do you mean i'm ask your question again yeah you 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 as a psychologist you i i'm sure that you have this topic with people lack of trust and so on and how how what 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 is possible Well, I guess I would approach it on a very specific basis. Are we talking about, you know, in a marriage? Are we talking about trusting a teenager with the car? <laughs> what are we talking about here? So I don't know. I probably don't have a blanket thing about trust. But yeah, I mean, if people have had trauma in their life, then definitely it's harder to trust. Um, and And they have to come to grips with the fact of what the trauma did in terms of disrupting their ability to feel like their things will work out or that things will come to a okay conclusion. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, well, there's trusting people, you know, can, can I trust this person to act morally or kindly or caring? But then there's, then there's just this bigger trust. Do you trust the world to be fair, to be just, you know, to be predictable? Those are harder things to address for sure. Well, there is always this saying, I wouldn't buy a used car from this person. Uh -huh. uh, that's, uh, yeah. And particularly in politics, you can apply that f frequently. I wouldn't trust to buy a the used car from him. I think, you know, it, for people that we don't know, I think we project our own attitude onto them. So I tend to trust strangers until I have a reason not to trust them. But I think that's because, you know, I, I'm going to be caring and, and kind to people. So I assume they're going to be the same. Um, and I think people who are very suspicious um and maybe still have a lot of unresolved trauma they tend to feel like they have to be careful with other people they don't necessarily approach a stranger openly um so i think with strangers we tend to project how we ourselves are and when you fall in love with somebody then the trust seems to to explode immediately and then um there's a difficulty to really see what the other person is and then afterwards it happened often to me then you get disappointed why could you trust a person like that you know well in german we have the the term vertrauensvorschuss so you advance trust and i usually was that way and it took me quite some time to realize that maybe I was too trusting. So that happened several times, yeah. And as you say, Christine, what the, the common mistake is, which I'm very much guilty of, is you project your own way of doing and being on other people. 
when you uh, uh, think you are uh, giving freedom to people or whatever, you know, and you trust that they would uh, appreciate it and they would do the same thing. But that's, that's such a trap. But on the other hand, to be always suspicious is not good either. So we need to find a sort of middle way, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm thinking of the family that stayed with you, Heidi, and and how you approach them, you know, with care and kindness and generosity, and you assumed that they would reciprocate and be be um, considerate. If nothing else, at least considerate. Um, but at some point, you had to, you know, you kept coming up with contrary. Uh, <laughs> contrary facts or contrary uh, situations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But this is also a sort of stupidity of my side. It happened to me often in my life. Uh, knowing spiral dynamics um, theoretically is one thing, but realizing it and uh, seeing the implications of that in real life is much more difficult. I uh, also, as a child, I have learned not to not to believe my own sensing, but more telling me, oh no, it's not like this, you know? And so even if I see the, the hints that this person is completely, let's say in blue, acting in blue or acting in orange or something, I, I, I still don't believe it when they use uh, sometimes words which seem to be at least in green or something, you know? this. Uh, to be able to, to see where people are at and accordingly adjust your own behavior. And not only after months, but a little earlier. That I think is my learning curve. <laughs> and without, you know, without uh, denigrating or without, um, this appreciating it because I could have avoided uh, negative experiences if I had uh, acted on what I sort of saw and should have seen <laughs> earlier, you know? Yeah, it's about expecting maybe your trust burdens somebody because you're expecting to, and they're not ready to handle it. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I don't think not only ready, but it's not their way of, of being. I see yeah. that especially women are often so manipulative and they don't really realize that they are. They think it's normal. Mm -hmm. And when the other person is not manipulative, at least not at this, this extent, and expects the same behavior by the others, that's just irrealistic. But that's where I fall into, into this trap, you know. Well, it because, also means, you know, if you were to accept the signs that you were seeing, you know, then you have to be willing to accept that into your life. And I know for myself, I will tend to think the best of somebody or give them a second, third, fourth, fifth chance. <laughs> I have friends who are very difficult um, to do things with because they're constantly changing the plan at the last minute. You know, there's a, they're, you know, they're the people I enjoy their company, but they're just not very reliable. And I guess, you know, there's, if I was to come to terms with that, I'd have to be willing to say, yes, this is part of my reality, instead of living in this perhaps more idealistic view of my friends or an idealistic view of human nature. If you look at the signs and you really accept them, then you're kind of inviting this skepticism in. And I think I think I resist that. Yeah, I think you nailed it. That's the idealistic view mm -hmm. uh, of uh, life and in, of people. And in some way it has to do with trust because we want to see some things and when we, when we, we realize there are some hints, we think it's all like we expected or like our ideal is. And then we see, oh no, there are only two or three points, but the rest is not fulfilled of the ideal. So we have given away that 
the trust too early, let's say in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the last thing, trust in yourself. I think we do the checkout round with trust in oneself. Uh, did you ever always have it? Did it get better? Did it get worse? Whatever. Um, I'm still learning to trust myself and not be overly influenced by other uh, other things and exclude my own experience. So I still have to work on trusting my own experience or reactions. Um, but I think you know, I think uh, developmentally so much of my life up until maybe the age of 50, at least, um, trying to strive and kind of put together a life, you know, working on all the things that adults work on, um, creating a family and a career and a home and all of that stuff, friendships. And then it wasn't probably until, you know, as Richard Rohr talks about it, you know, the second half of life, uh, the second half of life is really much more about being and being present. You, you've you've done all the striving and the achieving and you've created what you're going to create for the most part. Um, if you're fortunate enough to to have life uh, cooperate and, and uh, get some of the things you're striving for. Um, I know that doesn't always happen for people. But it's really only in the second half of life that I feel I'm more trusting and I can look at those issues more because I'm not striving as much. So I'm, I'm trying to be more present and just work more with my experience. Um, so that's more of a topic that I think really has only emerged for me, you know, since about age 50. Yeah, this makes sense to me too. Yeah, the older I get, the more I trust myself. <laughs> yeah, also because we have had certain experiences and we know we have overcome them. And so the next experience, okay, uh, we will make that too in some way. We don't know how, but it will, you know, we have enough resources, we have learned enough and we are creative enough that in some way we will manage. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, 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 Falling Upward is the book of Richard Rohr, which I already mm -hmm. listened to as an audio book mm -hmm. It's really good. And I, I think I yes, it already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it, 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 um, I realized that is also my experience like this. I'm realizing I'm getting darker and darker. It's almost, almost dark. You see the doggies are um, making noise. I think I leave that as my checkout. And um, you want to say something else, Monia? No, I'm fine. Trusting hey. myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I just had a final thought that as we trust ourselves more as we get older, the secret, though, is not to close down, right? The secret is still to remain open to people and not um, still, still be benevolent. To, so we can trust ourselves without losing that, that other thing. Sure. Yes, and this is also a learning curve, I think, and I'm about to learn that, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. You know, do you, I, I was wondering if we want to continue with this topic next time, we and um, I can send out, uh, or maybe I could send it to Heidi and she can send it out, like a video on attachment or some things to read on attachment. Mm -hmm. Very good. Everybody can then think about their own situation. Very good. So thank you. And you all for sparking. Bye bye. Have a beautiful day. Have a beautiful Evening. day. Evening. <laughs> bye. Okay. Bye bye.